Hello, I'm Cheryl Jones. We're making a special video for the members of Congress because we have an excellent lineup of speakers who've just finished a very important ex-conference, 2005, with some very important information we think you need to hear. Bingo. Thank you. That was it. <laughs> Four take, not bad, not bad. Okay, folks. There's a cocktail party in the, uh, in the, oh, okay, okay, well, uh, they're going to do a little more, but there's a cocktail party in the. Well, hello again, everyone. <laughs> it's been a while since we spoke. Thank you so much for coming to um, this uh, special panel. We've had a, just a wonderful, wonderful conference, and this time, this year, we thought we'd do something a little different, and that's uh, close out this conference with this special exopolitics panel. Now, we don't want you to think of it as a panel of exopolitical politics uh, or experts, but rather as a panel of human beings coming from differing perspectives, all of whom, like you, will be affected by the upcoming paradigm change. And those are words by Stephen Bassett. And... Uh, <laughs> I think uh, you know that he has quite a bit to say about that topic, and we want to, uh, again, just thank you so much for, for your attention and your patience with um, all of the uh, technical things that we've had to undergo this weekend, but it's been well, well worth it, and uh, I hope that uh, you return home with a lot of great stories to tell all of your friends who weren't able to attend. Steve's planning quite, um, quite a summary on the website that you'll be able to review, along with a lot of photographs and so on. And uh, yes, you are. <laughs> and um, summary on the website. Right. If after you get some sleep. What? So, yeah. once again, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome your moderator for this special exopolitical -polit panel, Steve Bassett. Thank you. Uh, this this goes up here. Okay. Okay, Ted. Ted, turn me on. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. Stay in the light. <laughs> I have to stay in the light? I mean, this light? You know, I, this is an episode of The X-Files. Remember this episode? I remember this episode. Okay, well, first, first, first thing. I have, a, I have a modest request I'd like to make. Paola Harris, the Italian tornado is, uh, is uh, uh, helping uh, Monsignor Baducci give an interview to the history panel. You see the logic? Maybe you didn't see that logic as clearly as I did at 1225 last night, <laughs> but there was a logic there. There are important things that even transcend banquets and entertainment and perfect situations. History channel. She seems to be concerned about being on the panel. I don't know why. I think she possibly she's afraid that we're going to turn into a rabble of rebellious men and go storming out of here, waving chairs, something like that, Revel screaming revolution. That's not going to happen. You know it, and I know it. So what I'd like you to do is, when she finally comes back after the thing, right? I'd like you to take a moment to sort of notice that she's down here and not up there. And then I would like you to slowly start a chant of Paola, Paola, Paola. <laughs> okay? Thank you. All right? We understand? We have this? We understand? Okay, good. <coughs> My feminist credentials could go right down the tube, right? Because I'm in, I'm in real vulnerable territory. Now, I do have, and we just have the one chair left. I mean, I, oh, there's another chair here, because we have two chairs. So, uh, was there any other? I could do. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, Lisa, would you like to join the panel? Uh, hang on just a moment. That is that is absolutely correct. I, is Betsy here? Betsy McDonald, are you here? Yep. Would you like to join us? Okay, Betsy. Forgive me, Lisa, but I was not thinking clearly. You can be my friend, okay? Just don't drink too much of that coffee, okay? Can't have a wild woman running around. Betsy, are you going to come and join us? Would you like to be in the panel, please? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to put her right here. OK. 
Okay, so we have one place left, which if uh, I don't get the proper response to this organized uh, peer pressure, I will probably bring somebody from the audience, perhaps at random. Come on down here, Betty, please. Down here, next to Stanton. Stanton knew her husband very, very well, worked with him. They go right back to those times. I think that's a good place. In fact, Mac, Dr. Maccabee is also. And we don't have a, have a thing, but I can probably correct that at some point. But thank you. OK, so you know what to do. All right, look, she said it very well. I want to make this very clear. I'm going to make two points very clear. This is not a panel of exopolitical experts. There are very few of those. Alfred Weber certainly has a certain a uh, claim to that. Michael Sal is developing a claim to that. But remember, it's not an encyclopedia, it's not in a dictionary, and you can't learn it in any campus. And so to call yourself an expert <coughs> would probably be a little unwise. They're not experts, okay. but they are human beings. And this isn't some panel on uh, the river overflow problems of the lower estuary of the Amazon River, and we're here to deal with that. We're dealing with the issue which will affect every living human being, period. Right, in ways they don't even know yet. And so we're all in it. We're all part of the panel. But these people have a little extra knowledge. Right? And so we're going to get something going, some questions. We'll get some questions from here, and we'll explore some things. And it could be very, very interesting. Right? There's a second thing you need to know. That, and this is sometimes never fully understood. But in this area particularly, you need to understand this. Just because a question is asked, just because a point is raised, just because something is said, doesn't mean that every person on the panel oh, is, 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 yeah, oh, yeah, that, that's great, that's great. There may be some things said that some person down there is inside going, screaming, you know, inside their head going, ah, it's insane. <laughs> we don't all agree. We're not going to all agree. It would be impossible to agree on this. We don't even know fully what's going on. That's not what a panel is about. It's not about mass agreement. It's about mass participation. Okay. The other reason I want to do this, which virtually never been done, if, you, if anybody knows of this happening before, let me know, I mean, uh, in this subject matter, is that, as you know, for years, there is a, a drumbeat mantra that turns up here and there, and even now, it turned up in an article by some astute writer, I think in the Chicago paper, the Chicago Sun or something, in which he basically said that uh, the people that that are interested in this subject are, are, are disenfranchised, disenchanted, lone nuts. Basically, that's what he said. And I've heard it before here, here and there, and everything else. Right? And we know it's ridiculous. So I wanted to show some power here. I wanted to show a front line, right? A front line that could take out the Rams. Front line, all right? I want to show some power. Right? Okay. I want to bring in every researcher, academic, that ever got in front of a camera and just because it's so cool to say, looked out there and said, I know what's going on. Hypnopompic sleep. Hypnopompic sleep. That's how Baker and the other colleague, at the, 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 the professor at Harvard, pretty much has dismissed the entire evidence. And, and research going into extra, uh, to, to contact the abduction phenomenon. It's just sleep paralysis. Hypnopompic sleep. Let's get him in here, let's sit him right down there, and let's drill him. Let's get him one of those PhD verbals, those oral exams, and see if they can hold up. They can hold up getting a softball question from some producer of a document who doesn't know anything, right, and manage to dismiss the entire work of John Mack with hypnopompic sleep. Are you getting sick of that? I'm getting sick of that. So let's put a panel like this right, on television, and let's bring in a few of the uh, uh, debunkers, and let's have a nice discussion. They won't do it. They won't do it because they know it would be a calamity for the skeptic reality. All right, so that's, 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 that's the reason. All right, now, how do you begin? How do we begin? Look, let's assume that there is a process going on leading to something, all right? If there wasn't, we wouldn't be here. It just wouldn't be important enough to be here. Based upon what you've learned in nearly 40 years of research, 
right, from a very grounded perspective, where do you think this process is going? Stanton. Our process? No, this process underway in the globe, this process of the research, the reaction to people, the media, uh, the sightings, evidence, all of this. Is it going anywhere or are we just spinning our wheels? I don't think we're spinning our wheels. We're waiting for the old guys who don't want to go along to die so the new generation <laughs> grows up that's accustomed oh. to the idea yeah. of Forgot. Sorry. I will help do this. I think where it's going is that we're waiting for the old, nasty, noisy naysayers to die while the young, adventurous souls grow up who think that we're part of a galactic neighborhood anyway. And one of them's going to want a Pulitzer Prize for breaking the story of the flying saucer. And maybe he can find a couple of old timers who are going to die anyway and figure, what can you do to me now? I'm going to spit it all out. There's a new book out that may be doing some of that, brand new. I don't have my copy yet. This is Bruce's. Uh, exempt from disclosure by Robert Collins and Richard Doty, the infamous Richard Doty, I should say. So I'm still an optimist. After all these years of talking to audiences across the world, I'm still convinced that most thinking people are behind us, with us in other words, <coughs> that the fear of ridicule is gradually decreasing, that in spite of the, uh, what's his name, Jennings? Paul Jennings? <laughs> what's his name? Uh, 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 hey, it's Stanton, Stanton. He's a Canadian guy. What are you trying to do to us here, right? You're mucking with us. He's You're not only a Canadian, us. but he shares my birthday. We're both dual citizens. I mean, that's really unfair. Uh, now, I'm an optimist still. I think as we get more people involved and as the press recognizes not only that people are interested in watching UFO shows, but that they're interested in the truth, and those aren't the same thing necessarily. <laughs> so I'm still an optimist, Steve. Thank you. Uh, by the way, folks, a, a panel, at any time somebody wants to get into something, you just, you just, you know, you let me know, raise your hand, whatever you got to do. Otherwise, I'll just keep kind of moving along. Um, when you got, when you formed your organization 40 years ago, approximately, 47, I guess, 37, 37 years ago, there must have been a lot of excitement. There must have been a lot of, of uh, anticipation, right, that uh, this was going somewhere and that something was going to happen. In those days, 37 years ago, did, did you, did the board, did the people that were starting the organization think about disclosure? Did they think about this kind of acknowledgement process? Did they think about contact even? Were these things a part of your thinking, Walter Andrews? <laughs> it's a good question, Steve. Some of us had high thoughts, high ideals when we first started. Disclosure is one of the factors. We've been waiting a long time for the government to come out and admit they've been lying about UFOs. We know that it's going to be difficult for them but to come back and admit after 50 some years that we were lying. Therefore, the only substantiation for that is that to announce the presence of UFOs might be more than the public can handle. With means of this nature, which we call public education, that excuse is uh, fading fast because there's, there is going to be no rioting in the streets or stock market crashes when they announce that we have alien visitation because it's been going on for maybe several hundred years. So we still have hopes that that is one way of bringing it out. But when people can accept the fact that we have visitation, UFOs have been here, they're not going to be upset. It'll be shocking. And let's get that shock over with and get on with the show. Thanks, Walter. Thank you. Um, you two gentlemen were contemporaries of Betsy McDonald's husband. You are scientists and engineers. Uh, 
life careers in it. You, did all, you went through all the courses, calculus, advanced calculus, and the other stuff that I couldn't pass. <laughs> and you've done real science, real engineering. You have great faith in the power of science. So did uh, Bill McDonald. Do, did you ever believe, and do you believe now, that this issue could be resolved by the sheer application of scientific principles by private citizens, right, in such a way that the science overwhelmingly proved and therefore political change occurred. And of course, I'm asking this of Dr. Wood and Dr. James Deardorff. Uh, why don't you start? Well, right? Okay. Do you understand the question a little bit quicker? Yeah, did yeah. I under... <coughs> Can the application of scientific principles? Did you ever believe that? Like, like Bill, uh, William McDonald believed that he, he was just going to do science of such quality that it would be so apparent that the rest would simply fall out. Right. That's precisely where I started with a little project at McDonald Douglas to attack it analytically. But I soon found out that there was a Condon committee that already had things in motion. And uh, the thing that impressed me was uh, Jim's initiative to say, Pick up the phone and call him. You know, there's usually a moment of truth in your life where you, you take <coughs> some act like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, Jim had the initiative uh, and drive to make sure that we attacked it with everything we had, whether it was technical or whether it was emotional. Uh, he was he was there and he recognized he recognized enthusiasm, he recognized talent, and he would not he, and he was persistent. Probably. More than anything, I have appreciated his persistence. He, he just never let go of his goal, which okay. was to get it out. So, but let me follow now. Today, the years have passed. Do you think it's possible today, applying fine engineering and science as citizens, right, in whatever way we can, to produce quality <coughs> science to a degree that the political resolution must come forward, or, uh, or is that not possible? Well, the short answer would be I think we can reverse engineer some things, but I think the disclosure process is actually going to involve something that people don't think about much, which is the declassification of millions of documents. And so if you're going to disclose it, the government has to take a step to decide how are they going to go through this process of declassifying things. And that's, that's what the disclosure means. Right, and, and declassification, which you're saying until enough documents are declassified, we, we may not see the kind of political... Uh, decisions we want, uh, but the declassification is a political decision, it's not a scientific decision generally. And so, uh, okay, uh, now, now, let, me, let me pose the same thing to James. Back then, did you think science could do it, and do you still feel that way now? Yeah, I sort of started out that way. It was around 1980. I'm a rather late comer here in the field. But uh, yeah, I was working on trying to interest scientists exclusively in the reality of the UFO phenomenon. Uh, but then I gradually learned that, uh, well, the ridicule, ridicule factor is extra strong, especially among scientists. And so it's got to be advanced, I think, on all fronts, including what we're doing here and with a grassroots uh, type of uh, impetus to the whole situation. So that... Uh, grassroots? Yeah. Are you talking revolution? No, I'm talking about the fact that the aliens themselves are providing sightings all over for various people to learn about and abductions for them to write about. And if they can spread the word and interest enough UFO investigators that the word can spread from the grassroots up, then scientists will have to pay more attention to it and uh, eventually they may come around at about the same time as their governments are forced to, perhaps from other reasons. Very interesting. Now let, let, me, let me recap very quickly what he just said. I, if I'm wrong, uh, doctor, I know you'll, you'll, you'll correct me. He is in, 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 he has implied something that I have talked about many times, right? Not with certainty, of course, but I mean, best guess. He's saying that this sighting stuff that's going on is not simply random, not simply coincidental. That uh, technology entities with great technology probably capable of coming and going without a lot of of, uh, of uh, ostentatiousness is deliberately being done to drive a human process on the ground. It's a political act, right? Driving a process toward what? Fear? Are you quaking in fear? 
driving a process perhaps to self-disclosure. Yeah, this is kind of a, a, a modification of the prime directive in a way. Uh, a kind way of, of, uh, of coming to dinner as opposed to just beating in the door, right, and coming in and saying what's on the table. He's saying there's a, that, that, that this whole citing thing, other than is, is, is a political engagement of an interesting kind by extraterrestrials. I happen to think that may be true, but believe me, I mean, there's smarter people than I that might disagree. I know someone that probably would have something to say about that. Alfred, do you agree with James? Uh, are, is the, are they driving some kind of a process down here? Well, I, I, I think that um, the, uh, what, what I have be begun to see and, and appreciate is how much of a holistic and interactive process we're all in and how all of the civilizations of universe society, including ourselves, even though we are somewhat in quarantine and in an entry level process, we're still members of universe society. We're kind of the ant in the attic or the kid in the basement or the kid in the corner. Uh, but what may be driving all of this is the galaxy itself, which is highly unstable and, and which tend to, tends to produce uh, events like uh, neutron star explosions and galactic superwaves with regularity. And so uh, uh, the, their, the all of uh, universe society's communication outreach and the, you know, the, the multiple sightings may be highly goal directed and uh, uh, toward kind of, well, wake up, wake up wake up, that, 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 that is, uh, it's not just an arbitrary time that it's time for us to be integrated, but functionally uh, uh, some sort of change in our universe status away from a, an, an embargo and toward cooperation and toward integration is made necessary because of severe environmental stress. Now, all of that comes at a, at, a, at a unique time of convergence. So I would say that science is converging, spirituality is converging, um, uh, our knowledge is converging, uh, universe society seems to be converging. Some of the information derived even through the scientific remote viewing is that the entire galaxy is tuned into this drama. We make good soap opera. <laughs> and believe it or not, they're rooting for us. So uh, what, what I've become to appreciate is the holistic aspect of it and how much of it Mother Nature is driving. Thank you. And you can see why, yes, absolutely. How many people here saw the movie The Truman Show? Guess what? We are the Truman Show. <laughs> the people on the outside are waiting for us to find that door in the outside boundary of uh, our existence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Boy, Bruce, I didn't know you had that kind of philosophy. I, I noted that, well, I don't want this. I have, I have my own mic. I, don't know. Uh, I noticed that his, his comment, galactic status, I thought that was kind of a neat phrase. There's a new movie coming out that looks super cool. And it's, of course, the movie of, from the book, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And if anybody knows about this book, it basically begins by a young man being, you know, uh, disturbed in the morning and tossed out of bed and learning from s some friend who turns out to be an alien that <coughs> there's a galactic freeway coming through and the Earth has to be destroyed. And so, consequently, <laughs> we've been condemned. And, and he gets sucked up to a plane, and as he's leaving, they, they blow the Earth up. Obviously, status has been reduced at that point. And but, he, but let, me, let me take a, a, another uh, approach to this, this, uh, this idea of, drive, of dr processes being driven. Let's assume that's true. Most profound process ever. Six billion people are being driven toward self-disclosure leading to something else, probably. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Something's cooking here, something's cooking down on the planet. All right, given the fact that men dominated virtually the creation of weapons from the very beginning, dominated the cracking open of the atom, the building of atom bombs, D 
dominated the essential conduct of warfare, virtually the slavery of peoples, all forms of Holocaust. Given the fact that men uh, in the last 10 years have displayed an extremely, I think, profound level of bad behavior that seems to have no end, right? My question to Betsy McDonald is an activist going way back, okay, way back. The extraterrestrials are trying to drive in a profound process down here. What is, well, isn't it a possibility that men are going to screw it up? <laughs> right? <laughs> What's to prevent the men from screwing this up? <laughs> like they have pretty much messed up before. Well, I, I really don't think it's men. That's the problem in our, in our society. I, I wouldn't say that. Really? That it's men. No. Um, All right. What, what's, what, 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 then where, where, where well, is this? Who you know, are the people that from? have to take it, uh, us out of it? It has to be international, it has to be working people, and it has to be youth and women. And that, they're the ones that have to uh, learn what are the problems and, and help to change. Not, I don't want to be facetious, and I happen to agree with that, and I was being a little facetious, but what I was trying to say, let me rephrase it. A good deal of the of the worldview and the structure that we have now at this time that this is going on, right? It's a male-dominated worldview. All right. It seems to me that is the way it is. And and one of my sensibilities was that unless women assert themselves and get much more power and influence and mitigate this worldview, which you see I still haven't fully mastered myself, that uh, we might miss this opportunity. In other words, a limited, narrow reaction without a much broader human uh, perspective, um, I'm worried about that. Is that a justifiable worry? Well, um, well I, I think of it as an international thing. And one of the things that really impressed me was Jaime Masson's uh, photographs and listening to the, the family that saw these things. I, I thought of it, the children, the families, uh, ordinary people. Uh, that's what impressed me uh, about the Mexican experience. And I thought we could learn a lot from that. Thank you, thank you. Just listening to that answer, don't you see the different perspective? But she's making an interesting point. If you take an international reaction, you are taking essentially a multinational reaction, multicultural reaction, without getting into the sex thing, male versus female. You get a <coughs> vector <coughs> sum of many na nations reacting, right? That raises the question as to what, are we at danger because virtually the timing, at least it seems to me, and the fundamental center of power on this resides and has resided solely in the United States? with the United States, and it has been, well, I, I'm told it's an American century, isn't it? This is the American century? Millennium. It's American millennium, okay? <laughs> now I'm an American and I'm thinking, okay, I got a century, I got a millennium, I'm feeling good about this, but then I'm thinking, <laughs> what if I'm not an American, right? I'm yeah. thinking, wow, I gotta live almost 100 years before I have even a chance for my century. So you've got this, you got this American response. We don't have the international response. Is that the way it is, Richard? Is that, does that resonate with you? I'm waiting for another country which is still in the bastion of freedom from American control to pull the trigger and start this whole process. Because I don't see it coming from America. All right. You got a, is, there, is there a candidate? Who, who do you think is potentially possible to do this? I don't know. I, I'm thinking um, there's a lot of information for reasons I haven't figured out coming out of India. There's China, always a wild card. Um, <clears throat> I, don't, uh, I don't really know how to talk about this topic of exopolitics. Um, I talk about the politics of secrecy and the politics of disclosure. We are in the phase of the politics of secrecy. We're trying to achieve the politics of disclosure and then, then get into the realm of what we would, might call exopolitics. The only thing I would want to say is that 
Before we are able to do that, we need to know exactly what is going on, and that's what disclosure is supposed to be about. And the thing that we have to remember is that if and when this happens, we have to know who's doing the disclosing and what are they telling us and how much truth are they giving us. And I, thank you, I don't, uh, I don't deny that we can speculate this, but I, I'm very skeptical of the ability of anyone sitting here to really know how this is all going to play out. Who in 1789 could predict that the king would lose his head in a couple of years in France? You can't. Who, who in 1914 would predict that Russia would lose their entire system of government in a couple of years? So once, once this thing starts, this is going to be like a tornado, and it's going to rip through the whole world. And what the end result will be, there's no one who can predict this. The, um, the, the basic issue that I personally see, apart from exopolitics and disclosure, is that in the future, I see a lot of people dying because we have a situation in this world that there is no way can be sustained for much longer. I think a lot of people understand this. All right, we have the doubling of our resource depletion occurring every 20 years or so. How long is this going to go before something really bad happens? Infrastructure collapse, wars, who knows what. So when, when disclosure and, ex, and exopolitical time occurs, it could be very well amid total devastation. And I mean really bad devastation of this, what we call civilization. Now, it doesn't have to be that way, but it could be that way. So we just have to keep in mind, and, and my feeling is that one of the true hopes we have is for a, a real disclosure, because th the system as it is, is is not going to get us into a better place, and disclosure could just scrub all the dirt away, if we're lucky, and, and have a chance of getting us into something better. Very good. Um, I want to make an important point here. And I'm doing my thing there, you know, about the unilateral you know, monolithic stuff. You, some of you are thinking, anti-American. I'm not anti-American, believe me. When I was born into this country in 1946, the 9th of December, I hit the lottery, all right? I didn't have any luck left after that, which is why I've never won anything ever since. <laughs> In fact, I built a significant portion of the Bellagio, but that's, I don't want to go into that. <clears throat> it doesn't get any better than this. But the way I see it is that <clears throat> it, as the oxygen levels keep going down globally, and as polar ice caps perhaps melt and other things are going, I don't somehow see that eventually as the, the oxygen levels will start dropping, you know, but when they hit the borders there of America, they're going, ooh, that's America, so we're going to keep the oxygen level up here and keep going down here, you know. And then the water will some come kind of some rising up there, and it'll go, uh, no, we can't flood America. We'll just take that extra water. We'll go over and flood Africa, all right? <coughs> so you see, we finally reached a point, as Barbara Ward pointed out, and quite a few other fine writers, a lot of them women, by the way, uh, that if you want to look at the future as an American century or a nationalist future. You can do it, but we're no longer there anymore. We now deal in a global reality. And I'm not talking New World Order, I'm talking global reality. This is a global engagement, right? India Daily is writing about this. They got a billion two over there, right? They may not even think about us, right? They got a billion two, we got 270 million. In a street fight, they kick us. We're doomed. They don't care. So it's, it, it, it's a global issue. You have to think about it globally. So uh, having these other nations get involved and getting away from the monolithic thing seems to me appropriate. And that's, that's the way I see it, all right? But that's not the way it's going. Not yet. Um, in the middle of all this, and remember, does it mean that everybody in this panel agrees with what I just said? In the middle of all, through all of this, and this was highly emphasized by Steven Spielberg, and uh, it was written by Les Baum in Taken. You may have read Taken. I've seen the, the miniseries Taken. How many saw the miniseries Taken? Decent number, I'm not surprised. Uh, what Les Baum did, remember, he's writing a, a miniseries, is that he substituted for a centrally dysfunctional, vast military intelligence complex, because that would be kind of hard to you know, knock off, 
and a screenplay, a military dysfunctional family. Now, some people probably got confused by that. They're thinking, you mean the whole cover-up is because, you know, you got one, you know, really nasty colonel and he's screwing everything up and, and now the sons are taking, no, 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 of course not. Dysfunctional family, substitute that. The military has been involved from the beginning. It's still involved, right? It has been affected in ways we can't even imagine. Right? So any, any resolution of this is going to involve the military, and there's going to be a lot of questions to answer there. Graham, you spent most of your life in the military. You know a lot of people there. How has it affected people that have served, that, that got information about this? Did it, did it, was it negative, positive? Did it make it difficult for them to, to serve with, uh, with full devotion? Yes, it was very confusing. And of course they tell you that it's national security and that's what your job is. And so you have to pretty much go along with keeping everything quiet. In my case, we saw a craft that we had a chance to study and we knew how it was propelled. And very few that we could talk to. The scientists we talked to would walk away from us. And there was no way that there was anybody. We kind of felt alone, and we wanted to. That's why when I finally retired, I decided to come forward. So I'm not part of the geopolitics, but I can tell you it's, it's, it's a rough thing. It really eats on you that you, you know all this, and you see what your government is doing and what the military is doing. And it, it, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow. Uh -huh. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. I've talked to a lot of military people about this, and uh, you know, I, I was raised in a military family, Navy family, and, and uh, let me tell you something, let me tell you something. An awful lot of very nasty civilian politics has occurred in this country, right, for a long time. Nasty stuff, and if you read history, you get some of it, and if you read the really good history, you get a lot more of it. Really nasty stuff, and, but overall, we're still cooking. You wanna know the reason we're still cooking? From the day this country was founded, we have had an extraordinary, consistently loyal and patriotic military. I don't think any country has had a better military, better patriotic and loyal. Just because once in a while you don't like what they're doing, the fact is in most countries if they get upset, they take over the country, right? I believe in this country if a real cool got out there, if the kind of stuff that the internet talks about really manifested itself, the military would shut it down like that, all right? So if I believe that, then there's a big conflict there, isn't there, right? A lot of good people torn. I've heard of stories of, of men uh, in dying in their last years un unloading some of this to a relative and feeling finally unburdened. This happens probably a lot more than we will, the, we will ever know. So we got the military. We've got science, right? And then we have another big institution which is really cooking these days, making a big comeback, right? I was, I was in uh, Georgia Tech, just a few miles from Emory College, when Thomas J.J. Altizer, a guy so smart that when he talked at Georgia Tech for one and a half hours, I am absolutely certain that I did not understand a single thing that he said. Okay. That's smart, all right? And he and another uh, two theologians had come up with a concept that God was dead. And uh, during, I think, my second year of, of, uh, of, of school at Georgia Tech, Time Magazine came out with a big cover, big black cover, and it said, God is dead, okay? Okay, and I'm, and, I, and I'm thinking, that's, that's cool, that's cool, right? So, and then you had, you know, so sec and secularism was cooking, and so things are going. Then things shifted, not surprisingly, and now religion is on the ascendant in a lot of ways, worldwide. We don't even go into why that is, right? But there are reasons for it, it's not accidental, right? We're having a global religious uh, renaissance in a sense. Renaissance in the sense of expansion, devotion, involvement, church attendance skyrocketing, right? And then you have a, a lot of other things going on, but that's always been the case. So at the same time that maybe, as, as, as James has said, we have a political process being driven from above through you know, kind of a manipulative thing, right? Manipulative process of, of, you know, let's hang over Mexico City for a couple of days and just show ourselves, you know, down there. Jaime Musan is saying, hey, if you're going to show yourself, why don't we go vid videotape you? So they do, and 25,000 videotapes turn up. That's not exactly, you know, cat burglars operated that way. They, they, they just couldn't make a living, all right? All right? So that process is going on at the same time we're having a religious expansion on the planet. Dr. Heiser, is that an accident? Is it coincidental? Is there any connection with that at all? And is this religious growth going to eventually clash 
with this paradigm change and create explosion? What? what? I, don't, I don't think anything is accidental. Um, that's not a declaration of determinism, but um, I don't think there are I don't think anything just happens accidentally. Uh, I, I do believe in convergences. <clears throat> I think there is uh, free will and determinism at the same time, so that's the bigger look. But to get to your specific question, we, we tend to cast this uh, religious explosion in a, in a postmodern way where the emphasis is on spirituality, uh, throwing off uh, strictures of traditional religion, but I think we also need to be mindful that part of the religious explosion is fundamentalism uh, of, of any number of varieties. And so it, it seems to me you have uh, religion growing at the poles. If you follow my metaphor here, that you've got a bulge over here and a bulge over here. And, and uh, I do think there, that issue not only is going to have to be settled uh, between the two ends of the pole, uh, one emphasis on strict, religious, rigorous, fundamentalism, uncompromising, militant, so on and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, is, is a natural opponent of the other side. And I think that's going to be part of, of any sort of resolution on this level. And then if there is some sort of disclosure event, uh, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to wonder if I'm more pessimistic than Art Bell. Because <laughs> every time I go in the show and talk about this, uh, I, I really try to be optimistic. But he's kind of wearing on me. I, I don't see, here's, here's why I'm, please don't understand, please understand I'm not saying I'm turning pessimistic about this. I, I'm always optimistic because I do believe that there's a God, I do believe in providence, I believe that he's ultimately in control and knows what he's doing. On the other hand though, I just don't see within the church, and I'll, I'll just speak for my own, within the, the evangelical church, I still do not see a willingness to think deeply about a whole lot of things, much less this thing. And I have my, I have my own frustrations just as a, as a professor, just trying to get people interested in their own faith on a very simple level. And uh, people just like to feel comfortable. They like to concentrate on family. They like to concentrate on uh, making a living. We have the pressures of our culture, uh, just our, our lifestyle. And I don't know if it's a time problem. I don't know if it's just a dumbing down education in the school problem. Uh, I don't know if it's just a laziness problem, a, a entertain me, you know, amuse, uh, amusing ourselves to death problem. Uh, it's probably a convergence of all of those things. So on the one hand, I do think it is headed somewhere. I think it is being guided. I think things will happen. There will be an ultimate resolution to it. But I see a bumpy road because I just don't see a willingness to think too deeply about a whole I, lot I have, of things. I have to do a follow-up here. Um, well, I would never want to underestimate the power of an adult bookstore to create consternation in a society, <coughs> in a neighborhood. And it does. Is it too unreasonable to say that a planet of people who have worldviews world defined within certain contexts suddenly is being openly engaged by beings powerful? But yet, in a modern context, much more difficult to assign as gods, right? And this is happening year after year after year after year, possibly at, uh, contact as well, abductions. Would that not cause any mass group of people to go for fundamentals? I mean, faced with unknown galactic implications, an unknown future, a paradigm change that makes the Copernican Revolution look like a tea party. I'd want to get down to fundamentals, right? I mean, could not, could not the extraterrestrial presence that we've been talking about since 1947 literally be driving a fundamentalist religion, a uh, religious revolution? It, um, it's hard to tell how, how uh, people would react. On, on one hand, I think there's probably a greater chance of some disclosure event triggering thought 
about the subject. I think that's inevitable. I mean, it, what what other thing would force you to think about you know reality and your your belief system? But it's hard to tell how people would react. Would they? Yeah, I, I think we 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 tend to assume that if this happens, people will just sort of drop all their their religious barriers and sort of look at each other and go, oh, we're human, and let's just drop all this other stuff, when what I hear you saying, and I think there, there is something to it, they might circle the wagons in their own camp and try to, to deal with things within their own camp and not just automatically or as a reflex um, move toward a more, for lack of a better term, globalistic, uh, outlook. I think that'll happen, but I I just don't see it as a as an I don't see it as an either or. I think I think mm -hmm. the reactions will be different. But the one the one common denominator, though, I do think that some kind of disclosure event would trigger, is it would wake people up. I think sufficiently that at least the majority would begin to start thinking deeply uh, about the things that that are really important. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. You know, one one uh, I've heard a theory propounded many many times. You hear it constantly that there is somehow a connection with the creation and dropping of these bombs in 40, uh, 45 with the emergence of this phenomena coming from, you know, expanding rapidly, 46, 47, and then boom, off it goes, and that there's a connection there, you know, big bombs, huge destruction, extraterrestrials are here. And that's interesting, because you say, well, if I'm a, if I'm a, a Hindu in India, or if I'm a, a Muslim in uh, Turkey or Iraq, uh, uh, or or, or a, a Roman Catholic in, in uh, Brazil, you know, and, and I didn't make any bombs and I didn't drop them on anybody, and some, you know, and, and suddenly you got all these things flying around. My attitude is going to be, who ordered that? And then if somebody comes to me, say, oh, you see, the reason they're here, because see, the United States, right, uh, uh, dropped a bunch of bombs and built a bunch of nuclear missiles, and they're concerned about that. So you say we got extraterrestrials all over. I mean, I got a, I got enough problems in my life, and it's because of the United States. Wow. It's kind of a drag, and it's possible these things are going to come eat our brains and everything else. <laughs> anybody ever thought of that in exopolitical? Everybody heard anybody heard that exopolitical idea tossed around on the Charlie Rose show? Uh, all right, now let's 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 Could let's. I let's, interject let's, something. Yes, please. One problem with uh, trying to figure out what people will do at the moment of disclosure or soon after is uh, that we haven't specified what that disclosure is going to be of. Simple disclosure might be they're out there, they're real, and people will go about their lives saying, so what, you know, we knew it all along, blah, blah. The exact antith antithesis of that might be, well, they're here to eat us, and the reaction is going to be totally different if that's what is disclosed. So, you know, religious, what people will do religiously and what will happen to the stock market and what's going to happen to big industrial companies and what's going to happen to university science, uh, uh, departments and people who uh, dig ditches and so on, it's going to depend on what the nature of this disclosure is. And we're saying there should be disclosure. But we might have to raise uh, the following question. Are we being ethical to ourselves if we disclose something which uh, is going to have an extremely negative impact on what people do? We asked in this ET article uh, that Jim and I and uh, two other authors wrote, we talked about, what about the ethics of the aliens? They haven't just landed and taken over or landed and said, here we are, you know, take me to your leader or perhaps I am your leader. Now maybe that's an ethical decision on their part that you have to have what in the Nixon administration was called a limited hangout. Uh, and, you know, bring us up to speed over a long period of years, which is, seems to be what's happening. I mean, they're, they're the drivers in this business, not us. We're, we're the reaction. We're the reactors. Um, so before you start asking the question of what's going to happen in, in, uh, to religious groups and so on, we have to specify what the nature of this disclosure is going to be. And, of course, a big problem is there are people out there who claim they know what the aliens are doing. They claim that the aliens are protecting us from other aliens or whatever. But I don't know whether we can believe them or not. There are people out there who say the aliens are the devil. There are people out there who say aliens are the angels, aliens are whatever. You name it, that's what the aliens are, but they're just not us. And our big problem 
is to find out whether we, whether we face love, hate, or indifference. And based on that sort of a thing, if we ever find it out, they, maybe they would tell us, and then we would have to ask ourselves the question, do we believe what they're saying? Exactly. But you know, that's, that, after you get that sort of an idea, specify what the nature of the disclosure is, and then we can ask, how are people going to react? Steve? Can I, can I ask you a quick, I, I just want to ask a quick question, you know, and then Michael. How long you worked for the government? I worked for the government since uh, 1972. And you were basically a scientist the whole time? Yes. That's 33 years, okay. You want to know why I have a panel? Okay. You know why it's sometimes it's nice to have a panel like this? If you're going to be a 30, if, if you're a 33 year government scientist, and you're going to say to a microphone and a camera uh, the question, what about the ethics of the aliens? You, you want to have a lot of people on both sides of you when you say that. You know what I'm saying? You don't want to be standing there alone going, uh, what about the ethics of the aliens? Think about it. 33 years serving government scientists in physics is talking about <coughs> speculating about the ethics of aliens. Does anybody think that the debunking explanation that this is a confused and deluded manifestation of a, dis, of a, of a bored culture, that that could hold up for one millisecond and yet it still does in the right context? I I'm going to have to go ugly here, not ugly, but dark. I'm going to go medieval for a moment. You know, we've, we've heard of, of, of the abduction phenomena, uh, read about it. And, uh, and uh, we've heard some of the terrifying accounts. Whitley's driver is probably as good as anybody at, at uh, describing the terror, right? But there have been more than a few references to uh, covert programs of military intimidation of people uh, and intelligence intimidation. In fact, 50,000 documents pertaining to MKUltra were just delivered on a CD disc to John Greenwald. He has them up on the website, right? Um, and that's just what gets delivered. I mean, a lot of stuff's going on. There are people that believe they have been handled in extraordinarily unusual ways by our own government. My question to Melinda, what's more painful, what, what's more disturbing to you to, to, to be coercively handled or dealt with by extraterrestrials return to your bed, or to be coercively damaged, hurt, terrorized by members of your own government? Are they the same, or is one worse than the other? Well, I can go with um, what all the cases I've worked with have said, as well as my own experience. And without a doubt, it's the latter. To have that power structure that we've been brought up to believe is there to serve us and to protect us and to inform us, not do that, and instead abuse us, is, um, is, very, is very difficult to come to terms with. A lot of the abductees that I talk to have a much easier time coming to terms with the fact they've had the alien experience than they've had the military experience. In fact, I can say that unanimously with all my cases. That's very much the case. Um, I also want to address what was said earlier um, it, by the last comment about what are the motives of the ETs? And from my research and what is happening to the abductees and to the degree we're being questioned about alien motives in our military reabductions, is that obviously they have a lot of knowledge about this and information and to the degree that they have involvement directly with the ETs. And again, this is from the accounts of the people having experiences. As an American citizen and as a world citizen, I say, Provide me the information so, so I can make a decision. Yes, I think we need to know what are their motives. And I think the government knows a lot of information about that. And that's part of what they need to share with us. We cannot be informed citizens if we're not provided information. And, thank you. And I'll open it up to say I think it's really exceptionally important, and I think I'm going to open up a whole can of worms by bringing this up, but we need a free and open media that can share that information with us and ask the hard questions. I see you have an agreement about that. Open government, 
tell the truth, open media, you know, find the truth. We seem to have some agreement there. Michael, you were going to follow up on uh, Dr. McAfee or, and follow up anything else you want because he's a, he, you're a very peripatetic man. I mean, you pretty much write about any aspect of this. Uh, and uh, so feel free to, to, uh, to do that now. Um, I want to touch on the... Oh, oh I, I'm I sorry. I'm sorry, Mike. I thought you meant it's Mike. Mike Sal, because he wanted to jump in. Gotcha. Forgive me. I wanted to touch on the idea of disclosure that uh, we really... Our aim, our focus should be on disclosure. And what I want to point out is that when we look at what is disclosure, what does it mean? It means trying to get the government to reveal the secrets. It means that we are kind of like uh, petitioners. You know, we are asking the, the government, those that have the power, to do something that will help us, that will make our lives uh, something more meaningful. And I think that's a very passive process. I mean, I think we can do much, much more than that. I think we can be proactive. I think we can look at this phenomenon not, not as one as purely being a matter of the government having dealings with extraterrestrials, but it's also a question of citizens having dealings with extraterrestrials. And that is something that we can all directly participate in. And I think, and I think it's a transformative process. I know 30 years ago, for example, in international politics or international diplomacy, the idea that citizens, private citizens, had a role to play in international politics or international diplomacy was just ridiculous. I mean, diplomats thought that this was something beyond the pale. They wouldn't even consider it. Now, 30 years later, they regularly have inter international diplomacy meetings where they have private citizens in there to discuss how citizens' diplomacy and international diplomacy can complement and cooperate with one another. And I think we need to do the same thing when it comes to this whole phenomenon involving extraterrestrials. It's not just a matter of governments secretly engaging in s diplomatic agreements and negotiations with extraterrestrials. It's also a question of we as private citizens coordinating informing ourselves about how we can be playing a proactive role in establishing relationships with visiting extraterrestrial nations and beings that do want to have relationships with the private citizens who they recognise as, as being representative of the, the highest consciousness and of the, of the soul of the planet. So we need to acknowledge that. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Dead. My viewpoint about a lot of things has changed as a result of living in Canada for 25 years and being a dual citizen for the last 11. And it seems to me one of the biggest obstacles we have in we, when we talk about disclosure is that what we're talking about is a loss of power for the United States government. We are, what, 3% of 5% of the world's population. We produce a much higher percentage than that of the world's pollution. We consume a much higher percentage than that of the world's goods, if you will. And anything that gives people the view that we are earthlings is going to cause the government of the United States to lose power. And I must admit that the first time in my life that I was ashamed to be an American was just a couple of years ago or so, when I heard that uh, we were going to make a new democracy, a model democracy in Iraq. And I, I couldn't fathom this, how you can expect to do that. But forgetting the politics of that for a minute, what struck me was that we have lost our support around the world instead of being the big guy on the hill who we want to emulate with a nasty blankety blank over there who wants to rule the world. And you know, if I were in India or China, which together have what, 40% of the world's population, something like that, 30 anyway, uh, you would wonder, the United States is spending its way into horrible debt around the world Naturally, they don't want people to think in terms of extraterrestrials being here. Because if they're just another earthling, they're in trouble. The guys in power are in trouble. So it's given me a, a different slant on things. And when people ask me why the cover-up, that's one of the reasons I give. As soon as people start thinking of themselves as earthlings, the guys in power are going to be in trouble. 
Will we give one vote per person to India and China? Are we going to settle for that? I doubt it very much. Well, we've given them all of our telemarketing centers, so we might as well give them a vote. <laughs> <laughs> they, they buy all our debt, too. <laughs> Steve? I've had some very great conversations to some nice people in Calcutta, and, I, and, uh, and they really work very hard, and I, I, I admire what they're trying to do. Steve? Yes. Can I ask uh, Stan Friedman a question? Of course. Um, do you think that there's any possibility that, that the, the U.S. could broker their, their position in some way? In other words, uh, could this thinking be possible uh, among those who know what they know and have you know, some decision-making capability over disclosure, that if they were the first to disclose uh, this, you know, the, the ET question, that they could somehow broker that into a position of primacy. That we broke this first and then somehow claim that we ought to be essentially put in charge of managing it. What do you think of that? Well, I, I think there may be people who think that way. I think it's a, it's a phony way to look at things because, again, we're 300 million versus uh, 5.7 billion, 6 billion for the planet. It's growing every day, but uh, you know, that's close enough. But if we could, if we could claim the high ground on back engineering, let's just you know, let's just speak hypothetically that that we've had this stuff for so many years and we've. You know, we haven't mastered it, but we've you know, back-engineered a lot of things, and we're ahead of the game. Uh, we're going to give it to you all, you mean? No, and you want to let no. us run the show? <laughs> no, it, it would be used as a rationale to manage the game. And that's it. Mm -hmm. May I follow up on that? I'm Absolutely. afraid we might try to do that, but I don't think it would work. <laughs> I, I would like to have the chance just to follow up on that, Michael. I, <clears throat> I do not believe that it would ever be in the interest of the United States government to initiate disclosure on this, at least not as it stands now, unless, I've been thinking about this, unless they were then to try to impose a kind of um, absolute, you know, total order over everything and just make it out and out open. But I don't know if that would be possible. I think that... Um, you know, you just can't disclose a little bit. So if you disclose, you may think you can disclose on your own terms for the first five minutes, but too many questions will arise. And when those questions arise, people are going to start to realize how bad this secrecy has been for so long and how, how it basically they've been living in a kind of fantasy world. And I think that there would be, there would be enough really angry people, really, really mad, that, again, I don't, I don't know where this whole thing would end up. So I, there probably are a couple of people, you know, in the government who think that, oh, yeah, we can do this and it'll, we'll leverage it into greater power. But I, I would bet that it would backfire if, on them. If I, Steve, if I could just, I don't want to prolong it, but, you know, it, it makes me wonder, uh, Rich, that, and I, and I hate to re resort to Hollywood, <laughs> but it, it seems like, Every time you see this sort of uh, secrecy and, and disclosure presented in the media or in Hollywood, that it, it, it sort of gets presented the same way or at least repetitively. In other words, that the, the way it's displayed in, in the media is that the U.S. had good reasons, they had good intentions, they've sort of put themselves in a box, and we're trying to make things right now. And I'm wondering if, if the broader culture has sort of been conditioned to think in that mode and soften the blow. Scary thought. We hope not. Any other comments? Uh, Al uh, Alfred. Alfred, I think. Yeah. Um, functionally speaking, I, I think with regard to the United States, um, the central factor is the permanent warfare state and the permanent warfare e e economy. Um, all of the information uh, that it would appear that our integration, in order for ourselves to, to integrate uh, with the rest of universe society, uh, we must transform our permanent warfare economy and our permanent warfare state. Warfare, violent conflict, resolution and taking 
the permanent warfare into outer space is not consistent with the rest of universe, the rest of universe society and with the galactic order of things. And the fact is that now, starting with the termination of the anti-ballistic missile treaty in June of 2002, uh, and with uh, the program set out in Vision for 2020 uh, by the US Space Command, which is to seize the military high ground of space and to dominate both space and Earth from space and to attempt to export monopoly capitalism uh, into space and dominate the mineral and other resources and the industrial capacity of the celestial bodies that's totally antithetical uh, to galactic good order and to the ethics and basic social organization of the universe. And that has been a basic block and I understand talking to a couple of the panelists that that was the dilemma that Dwight Eisenhower felt, and he jumped, we had hoped that he would have jumped toward the, the uh, position of, of de, de acquiring nuclear weapons back in the 50s and transforming uh, the permanent warfare state. The, uh, the question of the militarization and the weaponization of outer space and exporting the, the permanent warfare economy is a crucial question. And and that is where the linchpin stands. Because we, if we do that, we, we terminate our ability, we block our ability to be integrated into the universe, and we guarantee our planetary destruction because of instability into global nuclear war. On the other hand, by, sim by the simple act of banning weapons and warfare in space, we can take all that vast capacity, scientific talent and capacity of the aerospace industry and convert it into a space exploration and habitation industry which is consistent with an integration with universe society. So where the United States comes up is that it's the prime mover and it's built upon a permanent warfare economy. And until the United States moves beyond that as a prime mover of the arms race in space, we're at a loggerheads. And that's why we're looking to have a candidate in 2008 for president of the United States who will run on an exopolitical platform and change the dynamics. I agree with a definite shift needed away from militarism, and that's driving the experiences that I research as well. But you're talking about a complete, nothing short of a complete paradigm shift that I believe the military industrial community is benefiting from this technology. And we talked about how will the world react and that some are going to be pretty upset about the US having control over this. I think what's at the base of that is technologies that can benefit the world. And I think the withholding of those technologies, technologies that could certainly fix our ills of the environment, as well as many, many other factors and the economy of the world. I think other countries and individuals are going to be extremely upset by that. And I think that that power structure, that military industrial power structure, has absolutely zero desire to end currently how they're structured and their power and control and their economic gain that they are now gaining. Thank you. Um, it's 7 o'clock, but there is no way that I'm going to stop this, all right? They will keep the hors d'oeuvres in the oven, they'll keep the wine in the ice, and it'll be there when we get there. I want to point out that I could play a devil's advocate at any of these positions very easily. There are counter arguments to every single one of them, and I could give them. I'm not doing that. I can do that next time, right? We've had an awful lot of one-sidedness in this for a very long time. I want to let people express themselves, make their points, and if there's a lot of agreement, fine. Next time, maybe we can really get into a little more of the back and forth, but there are several, things, several points were brought up that, that, that resonate uh, with a very significant 
fact that I have uh, made <coughs> near the center of my uh, view of all this, and I'm going to give you a quick, quick little speech. And, and I want your reactions, or, or not. Um, if we view the human race as a family, the most damning statistic, factoid in the world, which is carefully monitored by a number of organizations, including the World Health Organization, and has been carefully monitored for many, many decades, is this one. And you've heard it. As a matter of fact, for the first time that I know, this statistic turned up on the cover of Parade Magazine just about three weeks ago, the most, uh, the highest uh, circulated magazine in the world. Uh, the number, it was a number, all right, it was 200 million, I believe. No, no, it wasn't 200 million, uh, 10 million. Uh, but you do the math. The point is that here's the statistic. Every single day in the world, with a bit of variance depending upon climate, approximately 26, 7,000 uh, um, human beings under the age of 16, we would call children, uh, starve to death, die of thirst, die of diseases generated by malnutrition, warfare, and other unnatural causes unnecessarily, 27,000 a day. That, that statistic is unacceptable, all right? We can't, it's so bad, it's so big that we can't get our minds around it, frankly. I don't know anybody who can get their minds around it. But let me put it in perspective for you. Imagine two giant World Trade Centers with 3,000 children playing in them, all right? And somebody blows them up and crashes to the ground, and CNN covers the whole thing. I mean, they, from, from start to finish. And as soon as that's done, another two buildings filled with 3,000 children crash to the ground. And before the day is over, nine trade centers have collapsed, and 27,000 children have been killed. And the next day, it starts all over again. I know a lot of people are saying, this statistic is not true. It's true. All right? Now, I'd like to make a positive, a modest proposal, right? Not in the Jonathan Twi uh, Swift <coughs> manner, but, but, but uh, uh, something a little more serious. If I'm a nation, and I have been tinkering with technology from other planets for five decades, I've been flying electrogravitic craft, as I believe is the case, over bases and testing them. If I have been integrating that technology possibly into our technology, if I have energy systems capable of desalinizing water at economic levels that would virtually flood arid land, if I had the propulsion systems to put, move food around the planet, burn up industrial waste, ship nuclear waste into the sun, if I could drop that number of 27,000 down to 1,000 a day, if I was a nation that could do that simply by telling the truth, you know, I have to think about that, right? You know, because I'm a leader of any agency or member of Congress or anything else, and I'm, and I'm thinking about that coalition building thing, right? I'm thinking, you know, if I could save 26,000 children a day, I bet I could make some friends. I could probably get a little political capital. I could you know, be a, a lot, I get a lot more, a lot more Christmas cards, Hanukkah cards. Now, you may, a lot of people say, well, this is almost shtick, isn't it? I mean, this is ridiculous, it's kind of a stupid thing. It isn't stupid, this is fact. They die, we have the technology. Edgar Mitchell admitted that himself. July, last year, in Roswell. He ain't the only one. Ro uh, Corso admitted it. Some of the people in this pan panel know it. Robert Wood knows, we got the technology. I asked Edgar Mitchell, I said, you know, gee, we got this technology. We keep sending our astronauts up in the air on exploding rockets. We fly them back on fuelless hot plates. We've lost 14. Seems like it's a counterproductive approach. He didn't answer that question. He's very loyal to NASA. I understand that. How many people are dying because of this cover-up? Have you ever thought of it that way? What's the political implications of that? All right? Anybody want to comment on that? If I, if I, let, me, let, me, let me be clear. Have, have, I, have I really gone off my rocker with that? Is that a reasonable assumption? Who wants to go first on that? Yeah, okay. Wait a minute. Uh, wrong mic. Well, well, the thought of uh, how many people have died. Uh, I, I did a, t a talk last year and, and looked at uh, murders associated with MJ-12, and there was, you know, 
maybe 30 that I could prove and another 30 or 40 that were suspicious and I think I'm probably off by an order of magnitude. So I think the answer is hundreds, maybe thousands, have perished indirectly. Now there's indirect impacts. But Want to put uh, a number on that? Well, it, it's just hard to speculate. It's hard to think about it. I haven't thought about it. And uh, maybe other panelists might do that. Well, uh, but, but I want to make one other thought right. for you. Um, the disclosure thing is a certain amount of pain for the United States and for the, and the whole country and the world. But the answer, it's going to happen anyway, even not through disclosure, but if you have the invention, the, the outright invention of a free energy machine, you're going to have the same level of turmoil. And that's likely to happen in the next, you know, depending upon your pessimistic or optimistic, but it's certainly in my lifetime, I'd give it five to 20 years. And then it, you've basically missed blown your opportunity to tell the truth. That's right. Okay. Yes, Richard. Sorry. I have, a, I have a question, and I think Stanton would most would best address this, uh, perhaps the best qualified of all of us. Um, and it seems to me there is a potential complicating factor in this disclosure process from a political point of view, not necessarily from our point of view, and that is we may be living in a galactic neighborhood riven by uh, or control, controlled or in, a, in a neighborhood that political factions are fighting over. We may not be contending with just one group or coalition of off-planet groups, and they may be, in time-proven fashion, be practicing divide-and-conquer politics, albeit without our knowledge. <laughs> to wit, have the United States government or factions within the government, or perhaps within, the, as I've taken a saying, the para-military-industrial-espionage uh, complex, cut deals with one or more of these factions, and has that even taken place within the government? For example, has faction A within that complex cut a deal with group number one, and faction B separately cut a group with group number t uh, a deal with group number two? And is this same scenario perhaps being played out elsewhere on the planet? In other words, is this situation also much more complex than we think? Of course, Stanton? Uh, obviously, I'm not a politician, but uh, my first view is why would any alien faction trust anybody on this planet? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm serious. And I, uh, incidentally, Steve, I have been using the number, I used it yesterday, I believe, that 30,000 children, I rounded it off, uh, died needlessly every day of preventable disease and starvation. Uh, I see that as quite conceivably one of the reasons that the aliens want to quarantine us because why would you let anybody with that kind of ethics we spend a trillion dollars a year on things military and we let 30,000 kids die every d day that could be more than saved with that amount of money why would an alien civilization want to deal with a, a group like that can I respond to that but let, let me add okay. one more thing okay Sometimes I really think we're the devil's island of this corner of the galaxy. They dumped all the bad boys and girls here, and that's why we're so nasty to each other. <laughs> Remember, yeah. Australia and uh, Georgia were started by convicts. But look how nice yes. they turned out. Well, you can, you can uh, the, the case can be made that we reside on a prison planet, yes, and that there is a galactic quarantine in, in, in force. However, what I was getting at was perhaps some factions are more benevolent and others more malevolent. And it's entirely considerable, uh, c uh, uh, conceivable that a very violent, very malevolent, very s highly psychopathic and sociopathic civilization would indeed, well, let me finish, <laughs> let me finish, would indeed make common calls with the um, warfare state, the better to uh, subdue the planet on their terms and also to establish a beachhead, potentially, which they could use to advance their own causes on a galactic scale against other more benevolent entities okay. and civilizations. I, I want to 
just one of 400 threads that we could run with probably for a couple of days, hold a seminar, give out continuing ed credits, OK? Are we even scratching the surface? We're not scratching the surface. But what's just arisen here you know, is uh, uh, one of the fundamental issues of exopolitics, all right? Which gets debated pretty fiercely at, at times in certain meetings, right? And, and, and in homes of, of, of researchers and on the internet where email allows you to, you know, fully display your inner self. And what I'm talking about is good alien versus bad alien. The good alien versus bad alien debate. That's a pretty significant debate. It isn't resolved yet, all right? I don't believe it's resolved. Okay. Logic says, not logic, but Occam's razor says that there are good aliens and bad aliens because there seems to be, that's a consistent thing, right? As you go higher up in the sentient scale, you seem, seem to get this divergence. But you can even have good cats and bad cats. I had a, I had a roommate that had a cat, it was clearly from hell. <laughs> All right? So let's simplify this. There's a potential that there's aliens out there that are here for transformative, profound changes that will make our planet far more livable. And there is a chance that there is entities out there that are here to do as they please, which includes annihilating all of us at their will. I don't know about you, but it seems like pretty heavy questions, and I thought maybe we, we could discuss that at the Ch Hasty Pudding Club, if not at least the Yale Debate Society, or maybe we could have a little chat about it on this week, or perhaps Ted Koppel would like to have one of those famous panels, right? All right? It's not that, it's not that I'm not, not concerned about Britney Spears' pregnancy. It's not that. It's not, it's, not that, it's not that I'm not torn over whether Scott Peterson should have been sentenced to death or not sentenced to death. I'm just saying, that we have this issue of good alien versus bad alien, and it seems pretty heavy, and it would be kind of nice if we would debate it publicly. Now, this is public, right? But this ain't the kind of public that I, you know that I'm talking about, right? Uh, now, somebody, nobody has a handle on this. I don't think anybody in this panel would say, oh, oh, oh I, I know, I know exactly what's going on. They're good aliens, and I, I know them all personally. And, and uh, and we've, you know, we've, we've shared bread and, and uh, chatted and so forth, and I can confidently tell you that everything is going to be just fine. Nobody in that panel is going to do that. Right? There are people that will do that. There are people like Marshall Applewhite that will do that. And there is a government that will say, well, you know, see, these people are just like Marshall Applewhite. So since Marshall did his thing, there's no need to have Stanton on, or, uh, I mean, uh, on Ted Koppel. They're absolutists. They have these delusional certainties. There are no certainties. These men and women don't have the certainties, but they're not on these programs. And they should be. Absolutely. And they can be on these programs if you and your neighbors, your neighbor's neighbors, said, I want more than Survivor. Right? Survivor Palau was good. I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm telling you. <laughs> it was good. Hey, I was on. Do I get credit? I was on Ted Koppel. No, no, no. He, 18 he, he, years ago. 18 years, right? <laughs> now, Stanton is a vigorous man. And once every 18 years, if he lives long enough, he's going to have one hell of a resume here. All right? Um, so I, I, I just, but that's one of the, the main issues. There are four or five more, right? Is anybody deny that exopolitics has got substance and absolutely cannot be ignored any longer. Now, you wanted to come in here. This is a man from Hollywood, okay? He lives out, he, li he hangs around with Hollywood people. He and Dan occasionally get together at the pool, have a sandwich, talk about the old days, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Saturday night, and uh, occasionally Dan will let him do a documentary, All right, may do some more. But you know, David's a pretty smart fellow. He knows, like I know, that Hollywood is now the second power center in America. And the only place that those guys and women, guys particularly on Capitol Hill, are really worried about is Hollywood. Right? That's where they're really worried. Because they know what Hollywood could do if it wanted to. And they know that there's not a lot that they could do about it and not a single person on that hill could make a decent movie that could bring in five bucks 
all right? <laughs> and so Sir, David Sarade has been engaging that. Would you like to talk about that? Sure. Let's talk about what Hollywood might do. What would happen if Dan Aykroyd decided to put $10 million behind exopolitical processes? Well, in a way, he's started it um, now. Um, in fact, when he did his show out there, he interviewed Stephen Greer, he interviewed John Mack, he interviewed a lot of people on this panel. And when that was shut down, uh, it was really upsetting for him. I remember talking with Dan over dinner about this. I mean, he wasn't going to make a lot of money on a TV show on sci-fi, but this was his personal passion, you know, to, to you know, set up a panel show where he can interview all the top experts on UFOs and other, you know, uh, government conspiracy theories. And that shut down. So the next move was, and you know, as I got to know Dan better, having dinner with Dan and talking with him is like, oh my God, if people could hear this conversation, um, especially his fans, we're all diehard people. That's, we travel across the whole country to come here to go to UFO uh, University for three days and then go back home and try to tell people what we heard and they just don't, they don't want to hear it. But I mean, look at Steven Spielberg. He started out, I mean, this is where I came in, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I mean, that was a show that showed uh, benevolent ETs coming here who wanted to help us and had these warm, glowing eyes and they wanted to hug you and they wanted to say everything is going to be all right. Well, they had technology far superior to ours. And now Steven Spielberg's coming out with War of the Worlds, which is designed to scare the hell out of all of us. Um, it's really, it oscillates back and forth. I mean, just, just think of those car chases in LA where you know, you're watching the police chase this guy in his car and, you, and you, you know, the police can go a little bit faster and they always seem to catch the guy. What if UFO technology was avail available to all of us? Instead of BMWs, we had you know, zero point energy, anti-gravity craft to go to work and one day you decide you don't want to pay your taxes or your parking tickets and you can do the speed of light and end up on the other side of the galaxy. The IRS can't can make you pay your taxes. You can commit crimes and get away with it. Where are they going to find you? This is the most terrifying thing, I, I believe, for our government, is what this technology represents is absolute freedom. Um, the freedom to even levitate stones and build your own hotels very easily. I mean, look at the pyramids. That was easy for them. That was probably a couple, a week's work. You know, to be able to, le if you can levitate a craft the size of, you know, what we saw in Phoenix, Think of what you could do with construction, building, you know, J.R. Token style temples out in the middle of the Rockies and you don't need a freeway to get there. That's independence, that's freedom and not having to pay a utility bill because you have your own zero point energy device in your ship and you park it in your home and you plug it in and the TV runs and internet runs, wireless technology. That is what is terrifying, the, they, the loss of control of this, the civilization. How do you control people who can move about that freely? Well, if you can move around that freely, would you even care about the, the concept of limitation? R resources galore in the universe. No shortage of resources, no shortages of energy, no shortage of fuel. What is the thief gonna steal that you can't get more of anywhere else anyway? I think initially there is fear in our government about us having this kind of freedom. So much freedom that we, we don't have that codependency that we now have with our government. We need them and they need us. But when we don't need them anymore and they don't need us, what happens? We're going to have to evolve to a much higher level of, of awareness and, and, and consciousness to go out and explore the universe like the Star Trek um, team did uh, and meet other beings and learn from them. Uh, that's our hope. But also looking back at the situation even the history of Islam, for example, after Muhammad came King Suleiman, who in the seventh century conquered the entire Middle East by brutal force, conquered religions that were thousands of years old with no respect, none at all. Now, what would happen? I mean, here we are. We invented the bomb. Einstein came here. He didn't want Hitler to have the bomb, so he gave it to us. Ever since we knew what that bomb could do, we have not used it once against a civilian population. It's a reserve. It's hiding in the background. We're playing around in Iraq with weapons that are, that are nowhere near uh, capable of, of producing the levels of genocide that biological weapons can and nuclear weapons can. That shows a certain amount of restraint in humanity that we have. Yes, we could clobber everybody right now if we wanted to, but we don't. 
And the question is, um, if this kind of power, this kind of technology that, that extraterrestrials uh, beckon us with were in the hands of the wrong guy out there, a fanatic, who wanted to come here and take away your freedom. You know, I, I was in Saudi Arabia in the year 2000 on September the 9th I got there and then we were hit, the towers hit. I saw it and I thought, oh my God, this must be a Godzilla movie. This can't be real, but it was real. Pe I mean, th this, is, this is what people do with power. So while our military on one hand is, is, is you know, keeping all this stuff covert, possibly for good reason, because once they reveal it to the public, everyone's gonna want it. Eventually, other people will get it. If it does get in the hands of the wrong people, anyone who's fanatical, they might use it against us. And we might lose this thing called freedom. We might live in a dictatorship. That's, those are the things that go on in their minds. I, I firmly believe that. But Hollywood, to answer your question, they have the power to play both sides. I mean, we've got aliens coming out of crop circles and signs that are killing everybody, and we've never seen anything like that come out of a crop circle. We've got E.T., Steven Spielberg, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and John Carpenter's Starman, and a lot of positive stuff. So I just, I think it's, it's an oscillation. We don't really know how this is gonna play out. And, and Hollywood just tries to show stories on both sides. Um, my film with Dan Aykroyd, I hope, for the first time, a major, major star will reach the, those people who never have pondered this subject before and, and will open the door to bring more people to come to these conferences to learn from, from so many brilliant people, really. Uh, David, uh, David's film was accepted to the Cannes Film Festival. What you're hearing here is a, uh, you just got a gen generational perspective there, okay? David is about a generation younger than most of the people on this panel, all right? There's actually one more generation beneath him, okay? You may not realize that, but he's a lot older than he looks. He's got kind of a Rob Lowe thing going. <laughs> 40, right? 43. Do I lie? Do I lie? Boy, I wish we had three 23-year-olds right here, you know? <laughs> I'd like to know what they think. I'm very concerned that they don't think much about this because they have a lot of cool youth to live and if the embargo is really effective on them. And you know what? They're gonna live with it. You and I are gonna be gone. When that nine billion people hits in the year 2050, I'm gonna be gone. They're gonna be having to deal with it, okay? You talk about crowded on the freeways, all right? By the way, after what he just said, I, I saw the future, it just came to me, you know, the future is sitting in the Maryland Vehicle Administration for about five hours to get a warp drive permit. <laughs> All right, I gotta get two more people in here and then we're gonna, we're gonna wrap this up. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe even three. I wanna talk a little bit about, uh, let, let me tell you two quick stories, all right? Because there's, there's an absurdness to this, which is, not absurdness, but there's just kind of a craziness to this. Lynn, do you wanna? Oh, okay, Lynn is gonna join, this is good, this is good. Uh, I think we, who, did we have an extra chair there? Yeah, down there next to David. He, he's 43, by the way. <laughs> so don't get any ideas. <laughs> I was invited to a party in Bethesda. A bunch of physicists, had been, I'd been going to their parties, you know, and, and they had a good friend. They said, look, we'd like you to meet him. Let's, I mean, oh, talk, okay, I went over there. And these are a bunch of <clears throat> uh, doctors, uh, not doctors, they're scientists. They're government scientists, just like Bruce. These are well-paid people, and they live in very nice houses. And uh, you know, they, when they party, they talk about ETs, and they got all the books and all that stuff. So I go over there, and they're really kind of cool. And they wanted me to come over and have a little dinner party. I went over and had a dinner party, right? About 70 people, they brought in Chinese food, I ate too much. And they had this friend, and he, he was a command sergeant major. Now, you, you, know, you know Bob Dean is a command sergeant major, but I gotta tell you, Bob Dean is not my image of a command sergeant major, okay? <laughs> He's my image of a, of, a, of, a, of a Lutheran preacher, okay? And he's got the greatest voice in ufology, and no one's ever beaten that. This guy was the real deal. He was an African-American, 66-year-old, bulky with a big neck, right? He didn't go to college. He didn't take any nonsense. And he, he lived his entire 40-year career in Army intelligence. He worked with... John Alexander, he worked with Stubblebine, he worked in Cambodia, he worked in Laos, he worked in just about all of the major programs. 
Why did they have me meet him? You know, just kind of a friendly gesture. Have a little chat. He said, look, let's talk about this. He says, yeah, OK, here's what I can tell you. There's extraterrestrials, absolutely. There have been crashes, absolutely. There have been crash retrievals. I was involved, OK? And we talked a little bit more, and that was it. I have a friend who is a colleague who is uh, working on a hill, and, and uh, this, this, this person was at a cocktail party in a hill. They have them all the time. This was a science kind of thing. There's a bunch of astronauts there and, and a couple of drinks. And one of the astronauts, lesser known, not, not the famous kind, a couple of drinks and said, yeah, there's extraterrestrials. Not, not deny it if, if, if you were to quote me, but yeah, of course there's extraterrestrials engaging the planet. <coughs> Jim's got a story. Jim, tell him about the interview that you got hold of, of an NSA agent, right? And what he had to say. I, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, forgive me. We have a mic gap down here. Uh, he's, he's actually pretty well known in the field, but it, and he didn't do many uh, video interviews. And this might be one of the last, if not the last one he did. But a lot of the information that's uh, been presented through the years, especially from uh, John Lear and, and other individuals, I'm sure Stanton's studied the guy. And you know, a lot of these people, they don't have uh, credentials that uh, they say they do. And others, uh, the, they do background checks, and it's hard to track them down. Uh, but this individual's uh, Bill English. But he, he does, uh, we did a live TV show, uh, you know, it was probably the, it is the, the first commercial daily UFO show. It was on five days a week for two and a half years. And the, uh, the manager uh, was very into this and said, no censorship, whatever you guys want to talk about. And it, I co-hosted the show with somebody who had been in top secret projects for the government for uh, many years and was told if they ever talked, they'd probably never see their children alive again is what uh, allegedly was stated, so they went into hiding for quite a few years and decided to p do this show to just get the information out to many, many people. So it kind of clears the air for yourself, too, for your own security, which I think is what Bob Lazar did, why he went to uh, Channel 8 and told what he knew. Um, so anyway, Bill English, uh, that is the interview we showed. It's a, it was a two-hour interview, but we condensed it down to about 20 minutes because he was the first national security analyst to ever uh, verify, in his opinion, of what he got access to as far as these papers he was shown to analyze of the extraterrestrial presence. But uh, similar to what Bob Dean had said, uh, what he allegedly saw at the uh, SHAPE uh, headquarters there. And many people I've met around the world have had similar access, access to some documents, or uh, you see duplicate copies of some things. Uh, another friend of mine was, he's one of the original uh, members of the Central Intelligence Agency, has eight PhDs, uh, one of the most intelligent men I've ever met. I've lost uh, contact with him somewhat now, but he, he has uh, you know, a copy of uh, the Yellow Jacket, which is basically the briefing document that they give to people like uh, a scientist that they have access uh, to the higher clearance levels for Area 51 or Pine Gap or back when Dulce was in operation. Thank you. I'll uh, put this here. Uh, uh, we're we're going to close pretty quickly, but I, I want to make sure every, every member of this panel talks. We're not going to be able to take questions from the audience, but in the cocktail party, you, you call me, you can, you can ask a question. Just isn't enough time. Next time we're going to have a three-hour deal. We're going to have an hour and 20 minutes of this and an hour and 20 minutes of nothing but audience questions. Dr. Katai. Okay, he's leading a very comfortable life. Very comfortable life. Phoenix. Husband's a doctor, she's a doctor. Prestige, prestige in the community, financial security, professional accomplishments, personal satisfaction. What am I doing here? Interesting life. <laughs> Actress. Everything's pretty good. And nothing wrong here. And then she sees something. It, it, it interests her. And she engages it. Right? I mean, this is a simple concept. If I need to get Lynn down to, Dr. Lynn, down to uh, the National Press Club and maybe over the White House Press and have her give him a little pep talk, you know? Here's what happens when you see extraordinary things. You engage them and get interested and write a story. It's not hard. So she makes a decision 
to come out. She's had a positive experience. Of course, her timing is fairly good. Right? So she's now a documentarist. She's a truth, a, a, a speaker to truth, speak truth to power kind of person. Right? You're in play. So you're shaping the politics. You know that. Right? This is just an entertainment thing you got going here. You know you are shaping people's views about things. Are you worried about that? Are you worried about getting caught up in this massive transition? It could be like a whitewater ride and you're getting carried down the river and you don't know how to control it? I have to tell you, Steve, this journey for me, from day one, um, a lot of work, a lot of um, thought and energy and monies, uh, has gone into just a heartfelt desire to not only find out personally a logical explanation for what I witnessed and photographed, but as an educator, and I've been an educator most of my life, I mean, even before medical school and my undergraduate work was in science education, and it just, as my son Dan said to me when he read the 750-page journal, after four years of intensive investigation and finding incredible data from most of the people on this panel, I have to tell you, I was blown away at the credibility of not only the people involved with the study of these unexplained phenomena, but the people that also experienced them. And when you hear it from the mouth of someone that has had such an incredible experience to them, that's real to them, and know how it's touched them at a very soul level, and you hear it over and over again, and I know how it touched me, and it, and it took time for it to sink in with me, so I certainly can appreciate, not only as a witness, but also as a physician, that there's healing here. I mean, it really is a healing thing to be able to acknowledge that something is going on and it's okay to talk about it and it's okay to get it out in the open and it's, uh, it's important to get it out in the open and I can't tell you and every bit of work and agony of whether I should come forward or not and I hope it continues, I have to say I've been more than overwhelmed and humbled by the response to all the hard work that went into um, compiling the book and certainly doing the documentary, but even more than that, just coming forward to be able to say, hey, you know, it's okay to talk about it. Most things can be explained, but there are a small percentage that can't. And we obviously know from what we've learned the last few days that these things are so extraordinary and so important to impart and to educate others. I, I can't, in good conscience, I mean, I have so much incredible photographic data myself that when I really had to soul search, how could I put that in a drawer? And I thought about it. I thought about putting it in a drawer, showing it to my grandchildren years from now and saying, do you believe this? Well, you know what? We have to talk about it now. I mean, it's, it's time. We just have to talk about it, get it out in the open, accept it, and study it. I mean, we really have to get to the next phase of our own evolution. And, you know, if I can be that small voice if, or a big voice, whatever it ends up to be, because I made a decision, anybody that reads the book will know that I made a conscious decision that wherever it leads, and I'm sure people on the panel here feel the same way, wherever this takes me, if that's the way it's meant to be, if it can help to open this up, whether it's politically or, and I really do feel, and, and, and you know, I heard it said a couple other times today that it's got to come from the people. And that's where it really has to come today. Certainly, people pressure will, will make changes. But just as, and I don't want to use the word revolution, but it just as changes have happened in the past, whether it be with women's rights or other issues, civil rights, it has to come from the people. And if enough people see something or learn about it, and that's, that's my place here too, to just read the data. The data speaks for itself. And if you learn about it, and the more people that learn about it, and especially youth, and the youth are ready for this, I know they're ready for this because they're contacting me. Somehow they're finding my website. Somehow we've been having packed houses in Scottsdale, Arizona, 
with a documentary for five weeks. I'm taking it next weekend up to Sedona and starting a tour up north. And we're actually, we've been chosen for the New York International Film Festival on Monday night, May 2nd, uh, which is um, very prestigious as well. And uh, Warner Brothers has already set a, a screening for it, anybody out in the LA area, for August the 19th. And again, I'm just going with the flow, and it seems the puzzle pieces are all fitting together. But the most important thing is that the people spread the word for everybody here. And just look at the data. Look at the data and tell one person. It's going to tell another person. It's just like a pebble in a pond. It's just going to start spreading further and further and further apart till the people the people are really going to make the changes. And again, I hope I can be a small part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, look, you know, a while back, after a hiatus, for whatever reason, John Lear turned up on the Art Bell show and made a super case, you know, a heavy-duty case for why disclosure just ain't going to happen. You know, you're not going to learn all that stuff because it's so bad, so awful, and all this and everything else. <laughs> You know, and I wrote a response, and I contacted Art and asked if I'd come on and debate it. I didn't hear it back. I, I, I fell off the speed dial. You know, it's one of those things, you know, EMP thing, or probably. No, we're not going to have disclosure. Cannes Film Festival, New York Film Festival, right? Same panel, this conference, right? And you don't think things are changing? Let's yeah. go back to 1956. Uh, what were the the uh, extraterrestrial phenomena contributions to the Cannes in New York during those years. I, I can't remember them. Have you talked on Okay. All right, we're gonna get, we gotta get, wrap this up. We're gonna get, uh, we're gonna get, uh, I wanna do a dark point here. I need a short, I need a little shorter answers, folks. We, we do have to wrap this up. David Coote was infinitely involved in the missing in action, the MIA issue. He firmly believes that they left people behind. A lot of people do, I, I imagine that they did. Government left them behind. Same government that will go on tell you TV and, and talk about the absolute imperative that regardless of your political persuasion, you must support the troops. Yeah. Until they're inconveniently out of reach. Simple question, David. Is the government leaving us behind on this issue? Are we the paradigm MIAs now? I'll try and Are keep they it brief. Come back and get us. I'll try and keep it brief, Steve. Thanks for asking the question. Um, the government, your elected government, there are very, very many good people in government and in intelligence in uh, a lot of these organizations, but we're sold out at the top. I feel the extraterrestrial issue is a uh, very significant piece of the puzzle, yet it is only one piece of the puzzle. There is much suppression of truth. Uh, we are at war, it seems, and the first casualty is truth, and it's still the truth. Um, I guess Jesus and the CIA both agreed that to know the truth is going to set you free. So how do we get that out? Disclosure and the embargo, as Stephen says. Who is the government? You're the government. We're the government. Until we can make the bureaucrats absolutely irrelevant by bringing through our own truth, bring it out, networking, how many people from the media here? You're all from the media. It's it's one on one. It's the only kind of uh, imparting understanding, awareness, and knowledge that cannot be controlled by a central organization. This country was set up for decentralization of power. Unfortunately, you put everything under one banner. It's going to be controlled. We seem to be under a monopoly right now. Well, how do we break that monopoly, folks? There is a higher power, and for everything negative we look at. We've got to take 10 looks at the positive. We have the power to accomplish this goal. We must get the modern day G-O-D out of this world, namely guns, oil and drugs, those things that make money and control. We must get control of our wealth again. Folks, it's right in front of your face. Why do we not have the wealth? Our constitution says only Congress can coin money and set the value thereof. No state shall use anything in t for tender other than gold and silver coin. Yes, you can use money, but it's going to be backed by something. You can use ca uh, paper, but it's going to be backed by something intrinsic. We have nothing intrinsic. It's a fiat currency. There are a lot more pieces to this puzzle. 
the Federal Reserve scam, the IRS scam, it's unconstitutional. We need to go to our locals, our local representatives, and put some serious heat on them. It must work from the ground up. You can't cut the head off this thing until you cut the funding off. There are organizations that can help you. There are organizations you can join with, and we can unite on this one. We all have a common goal, and that is to get the power back to the people. Folks, we need to get God back into the equation. And when the student is ready, the teacher will come. We won't need disclosure, and it's out of our hands. They'll come to us. Thank you, Thank David. You. Um, I made a decision just about 60 seconds ago. Uh, it's an easy one to make. Uh, Ted obviously has filmed all this. Uh, it's going to be about two hours. We're going to make 535 copies of this panel presentation, and I will do something I have done before. I will deliver a copy to every member of the House and Senate with a personal cover letter suggesting that they watch this panel discussion. Just so that when they get this, and should they happen to read it, or, or watch it rather, they, they, they think they've gotten a two-hour expanded version of Washington Week in Review. <laughs> this is, after all, an uh, exopolitics panel. Extraterrestrial phenomena issues are at st uh, uh, bay here. So I, I want to finish this way, all right? The, uh, wait, 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 where'd he go? He didn't, I didn't lose him. Ah, yes. These two men here are on a cutting edge because they deal, or have dealt, or have engaged in close encounters of the fifth kind. Close encounters of the fifth kind, all right? This is getting into the good stuff, stuff that makes it interesting. It's a spice in the stew, all right? But it's probably true. Certainly part of it is. Don is part of this, was part of, still is part of C-SETI essentially ambassadors of the universe. That's Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind because it is directed engagement and they're responding, okay? That is a directed response. That's fifth kind. And Charles Hall, based on what I understand of the story at this point, was very likely sent out just like those light beams that are sent out by some of those teams that go out, and I've gone out with one of them, and so I had a good time, to see the kind of reaction <coughs> you would get. Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. So in addition to all the politics and everything else you see here, right, you've got that too. Let us not forget, all right, that while we can make it really sound, you know, very academic and safe and, you know, you could talk about it in any company, which all of these people can do, behind it are extraterrestrials. So we're going to finish this way. I'd like Charles to, 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 to say basically, what does it feel like now, these years later, and the current status of the disclosure process, whatever's going on, to, 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 and think back on this fifth kind experience that you talk about, right? Clearly, it's changed you. It's obviously defined your life in many ways. What, what, what's, what's, what, what are you sensing? What are you feeling now, 2005, after that? Um, well, um <laughs> of course, I could talk for hours on that topic. Um, and you know, I'd love you to, Charles. Yeah. I really would. <laughs> but, but, but in a word, that's why I wrote my books, Millennial Hospitality. I was, I was trying to capture how it felt, when t how I felt when those events were happening to me for real. And by so doing, I was trying to convey that feeling originally to my children and grandchildren. And because the books began as an autobiography. A and, and I'm sure that when disclosure happens, my own personal opinion is that each of you will have a similar point of view, that you'll, th the way you feel when that happens, you'll want to convey to your children and grandchildren too. E each of you is probably proud of how, y uh, of, and remembers well how you felt when say 9-11 occurred or or, or those of you who are old enough remember what you were doing on Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, and, and, and you probably are proudly look forward to conveying that to your children, your grandchildren, perhaps your great-grandchildren, uh, of letting them know how you felt when those events were happening. And that's just how I feel about 
having met the tall whites out in the Nevada desert. Uh, 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 all of those times, the good times, the bad times, uh, the, the terror, the, the happy times, all those emotions, they're like burned in you. And, and, and see, now you, see, see now when you think of what it's like to meet an extraterrestrial, if you're like me, you're, you, the way I was before I was actually out in the desert, uh, my, or, or in Vietnam, what I expected was going to happen was trained, was, what it, was well, however I'd been trained by Hollywood. And then when it happened, the sh the, there was like a double shock because Hollywood had kind of expected that, based on my the movies I'd seen, it was supposed to be different, you know. Uh, Hollywood has kind of taught us, for example, that before we actually talk to an extraterrestrial person, we're supposed to see lights in the sky, right? I mean, we all know how the Hollywood movie is supposed to go. You're supposed to be out there and see lights, and then they're supposed to flash, and they're supposed to have formations, and then they're supposed to land. And yeah, they really, Hollywood really hadn't prepared me for, the, for, for one of my initial encounters of just sleeping in the barracks and having the Air Force generals come through with their, tall, with their alien counterparts talking about their projects. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just no, no warning, no shock. There, Hollywood hadn't prepared me for the fact that I, in lo, those early encounters in 65, that I might get up and walk out through the front door to the flight line, and sitting there is an alien scout craft that the American generals and the aliens have used to come on their tour. You see, and when you talk about disclosure, so you probably have all expected that it's going to be some way and, it, and, and, and like before I went to Vietnam, I had expected it was going to be some way, like, like the John Wayne film. And when I got there, it was a horrible shock. And just talking with aliens is the same way. Y you probably have guessed what it might be like to talk to an alien. But as you see in my books, I really wasn't ready for having a tall white alien lady come up and talk about dress fashions, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I expected they were going to talk about the, the wisdom of the universe and the pollution and no what she wanted to know was wh how much it would cost to get her a pretty dress for her I, I wasn't expecting her to come up with her little girl and proudly show off the the frill that she had put her, that she personally had sewed around the suit of her little girl and she was so much like us the men who served with me one day were, there were several of us and one of them was saying he didn't know if they were really that much like us or if they were just so smart they were pretending to be and one of the things I did was prove that they really were that much like us. So when you talk about disclosure and, and all that stuff, be ready for the shock because the world that you feel today simply ends, okay? It simply Thank ends. Thank you, John. Okay, Jim, would like to add something here? Quick, Jim, very good, please. Just a second. Uh, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna go over and we'll back edit that, all right, including what I just said. No, that's for later, not for this, for later. Go ahead. How much time does it take to change the tape? Forgive us. There's something I need to do. It's something I want to do. You'll understand why in a second. It's got to be on this tape. But it doesn't have to be on that tape. But he has to change. Then he will, he will edit out some of the earlier material. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. And then Don. OK. Look, I'm going to take an opportunity to say something here. I've known Stephen Greer for a, a long time, but not, as a co not, not really as a friend. I'm, I'm not his friend. I don't get invited to the house, but I'm very much intimate with what he's done, all right? And he's taken a huge amount of grief over the C-SETI program and the ambassadors of the universe, right? You know, a lot of grief gets tossed around in this field because somebody's out there doing something, you know? It's like, I, I'm, I'm doing crop circle research. It's very important. And that idiot's over there calling me out. You know, idiot, idiot. You know. Where's the email? You know, all that stuff, right? It kind of bugs me. Eh, you know, some people are difficult, so what? All right? Guess what he did? After all the evidence had been amassed for about 50 years, clearly they're there. He said, why don't we go out and say hello? Exactly what is odd about that? To go out in the area and flash some lights and meditate. They are telepathic, you know, at least 50,000 contactees have said so, and go out and engage them. Oh, it's awful, it's awful. Oh, my God, it'll ruin a science. And 
oh, I'll never be able to get you know, a hearing in Congress because, uh, you know, I mean, that, that, that's like somebody goes to, uh, that's like somebody lives in Hawaii and a bunch of Asian tourists come in, you know, and you huddle in your house going, you know, why don't you just go out and say hello? Oh, can't do that, can't do that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what he did. And they get a response. That's what happens. That's simple. Close encounter of the fifth kind. Don did it. Don, let me ask you. Before you had that, right? First time that you flashed a light, did something, and got a response back, and what you're pretty sure was an extraterrestrial. And then afterwards, what was the difference? What was it like? What was it like to go from, eh, maybe they're here, maybe they're not, to my God, they're sending me signals? <laughs> well, I've always been an open minded seeker of truth, and uh, I'd done a lot of study, and, and when I heard Dr. Greer speak, so many things I'd been trying to put together for years just came together and clicked, and I said, he's on to something. So I went out on the, uh, the C-SETI training, and I thought I was pretty ready, and that first night when, when that event that I described the first day happened, it was like being in an earthquake. You take the ground for granted as being granite, being solid, and when it shakes under your feet, even though you know that it can do it, it shakes up your paradigm just a little bit, and you're just a little off balance for a few days. Um, so that, I went through a lot of soul searching and, you know, am I deceiving myself and what is all going on and, and, uh, and, and was settling in. And I might as well go out on a limb here. I've been doing that all week, but I'll go further out. The, uh, I think it was the fourth night okay. in the field in 1999, June, June of 99. Um, we were in the circle and Dr. Greer was talking and off to the east side of the circle I was seeing, much more plainly than earlier nights, very humanoid-shaped light form beings. And I'm looking at them, and I'm, yeah, they're still there. <coughs> and uh, he's talking, and yeah, they're still there. You, if you look too hard, you'd lose them. If, if you focused real tight, you'd lose them. It, it was more of a soft focus type thing. Uh, like thousands of little blue-white skin-lating fireflies, just barely bleeding into perception, but in a humanoid shape. And so there was a short pause, and I said, uh, Steve, do you see what I see over there? And he says, yeah, I've been watching him for a few minutes. And I said, okay. And so we all got up, and we stood in a line over there, and there seemed to be one of them paired up with each one of us. And the one in front of me was about five feet tall and about four or five feet in front of me. And uh, I could make out some facial features and uh, general uh, uh, bone structure, musculature. It was not, not like on... Uh, the movies where it's where it's real plain. It was it was subtle, but it was it was enough I could make out some facial features and stuff. And I said, well, okay, we're supposed to be ambassadors to the universe, so I might as well give this a try. And I just kind of thought projected, uh, like talking but not out loud, who I was and what we were trying to do. And I was expecting a voice in my head or some kind of verbal message. Uh, uh, a, a few words, a sentence, whatever, uh, is the way we normally communicate and what we expect to get back. And instead, what I got was two very powerful, very distinct emotions. The first was unconditional love. And it's, you know, like your puppy dog has for you or you have for your kids. Even if they mess up, you still love them, you still want them to succeed. It was just unconditional love, just very powerful, very distinct, unmistakable. Second was intense gratitude. And like many of you, I went, huh? And the moment I mentally went, huh, the, the impression came back that it was because there was anybody on this dysfunctional planet that was working towards peaceful relations with them, when what they generally see is the covert guys trying to shoot them down with particle beam weapons or something. And... Not yet. What? Okay. So you have a few experiences like that. It kind of changes you. Um, it's been a... Gradual but profound Whatever awakening. You can find it. <laughs> it's been a gradual but profound awakening over the past several years. That was almost five years ago. Uh, in in a number of ways, um, psychically, uh, emotionally, uh, spiritually, uh, <coughs> politically, environmentally, I become much more of an activist. Um, I, I miss the 60s, but I'm catching up now. Some of you have my free radical card. It says pilot, mystic, philosopher, poet, ambassador to the universe. Uh, 
And somebody asked me, are you really a poet? And I said, it's on Descartes, therefore I am. <laughs> um, but I think as more and more people have this kind of awakening, and I think a, a much larger number than we realize are awakening to these kind of realities and these kind of increased consciousness, uh, we will become not only self-governing, but ungovernable. And I think that's what scares the hell out of government. Thank you, Ron. I want to apologize for that little mic interrupt us there, but uh, we'll, that'll all be edited. It won't be a problem, all right? So now, we'll finish this way. Senator, Congressman, Congresswoman. I'd like to introduce you to airline captain, veteran, physicist, citizen activist, historian, MIA activist, airline captain, a doctor of political science, a doctor of, I think, history, no, I'm sorry. doctor of political science, Juris doctor of Yale, a feminist, activist, right? Naval lab scientist, PhD, former physicist, nuclear physicist, physicist, scientist, activist, energy specialist, financial specialist, researcher, longtime scientist, biblical scholar, airline captain, researcher, PhD in religious studies, speaks five languages, commander of the Navy, right? veteran, builder of the largest organization of its kind in the field in the history of the human race, organizer, producer, creator, writer, and an activist, a noted heart specialist, doctor. All right. These are the people who you do not feel have a matter that should be brought to your attention and for you to dispose with. I invite you to reconsider that position and do your job as a representative of the American people and respond to these people's concern. Anything less is inappropriate and an embarrassment to your position as a member of the great deliberative body of the United States government. So with that, I say good night. Stay here. Can you speak us up, please? What? What? Can hear you, you didn't have the mic. Yeah, no. Did that, did that, that came in on the mic, didn't it, Ted? Yeah. It was all right. I think we're okay. No, it's all right. Okay. Cheryl, please come up. If we can get this on tape, we'll do that too. Are there any other speakers here? Yes. Yeah. Karana Baducci, please. Paola. Don't, 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 don't. <laughs> I will. I'm about to do that. Okay. Uh, uh, can we? Can Carrado, Baduchi, and you please come up? We're taking final photos. Okay. No, no. I would like them to come up, and if you can, can they? Can you work it so he can get by? I need them to get to the middle. All right. Uh, she just did. Well, she's good. No, no, of course she is. That's why I had her introduce introduce the thing, and I ended it. But you're right; I could have brought her in again. So. She still can do it. Well, I can. She can uh, well, okay. I'll, I mean, she let can me do see what clear. I can do. Let she, me see what I can do. It. Okay, okay, okay. You're right. You're right. We'll do that. Any other speakers? They can come up. They're not here. Okay, we got them all. Okay. No, 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 no. Sit down, please. Front row, sit down. I'd like I'd like the the other back speakers to come more to the middle. To the middle. Is, is it possible? Please, thank you. All the way to the middle. Uh, I, 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 I may stay here. Okay? No. Uh, yes, come down here, please. Okay? Anybody else shows up, make sure they come up. I agree. Cheryl? All right. We're still rolling, right, Ted? Okay. All right, Cheryl. 
please just uh, say a final goodbye to these wonderful people that have come, in many cases, a very long ways, to be at this nice conference. Would you please? A final goodbye to the very nice people who've come a very long way to be at this very nice conference. That was excellently <laughs> done. Okay. We should take this act on the road. Yes, so yes. Did, yes. Again, thanks so much. It's been a wonderful weekend. Thanks for inviting me back to be your host, co-host, and to help out in between the, uh, the uh, gaps here and there. And um, again, hasn't it been wonderful? Let's give Steve Bassett, the executive producer of this conference, a big hand. All right. All right, so what I'm going to do here is, um, I, I think I know how I'll do this. I think this is the way to do this. All right, Cheryl, there's a seat for you, a seat for me, so we don't want to block these fine people. Go ahead and take all the shots you got, all right? <laughs> Sit back just a little bit. If you can get back there and you can get the entire panel, Right? No matter how far back, remember, in the current cameras, once you get it inside the computer, you can make it what you want. It'll be just fine. And, we need, uh, somebody and if somebody could go to the back side, off to that side, and take pictures of the pe pe people That'd taking pictures, well. that would be kind of nice, there. too. A couple shots of those. I need those as well, thank you. And if somebody could get down along and shoot along the entire panel, right, to get them in that way, that would be nice. <laughs> Uh, Sergio, you're so such a. Exposed, exposed. Be sure and get a picture of my, le of my left, yes. left wrist. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, yes. <laughs> Care of Sergio Lube of Wal uh, Walnut Creek, California. A jeweler, a networker, a man, a connoisseur. Quite a guy. Yes. Picture says a thousand words. There's a lot more than that said here. It's a serious business. You know what I was thinking about? What did did again in a very uh, friendly way to introduce this day to this conference. Mm -hmm. Because it should be considered antagonistic. You know, it's a nail. Right, it's right. It's a nail force way, mm -hmm. of course. So you yeah, should do this again from this point. Not necessarily. Well, I know what he's saying. You know, just the OK. OK, we're going to do this. Don't just keep doing what you're doing. It's not a problem. <laughs> Cheryl, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to stand up and talk to the camera and say, uh, I'm Cheryl Jones. Uh, I've recently hosted this wonderful conference. And we are, would like to present to you the speakers, because we'd like you to know about what they're talking about, what they're saying, right? And you'd appreciate it if you would give it some consideration. All right? So basically, oh, introduce right. that to the members of Congress that will get this tape. You want to stand up for that? Sure. Okay. You're looking at which I camera, I am standing. Ted? Which, which <laughs> camera, Ted? <laughs> Ted's camera's right there, okay. Introduce this uh, little thing to the congressperson who's going to get this uh, shortly in the mail. Not in the mail, they're gonna be hand delivered. Okay, is it? Is it right there, Sarah. Right, right there. Okay, Just right there. I'm waiting until everyone oh, is. All right, we're gonna come to the middle for a while, that's fine, that's okay. All right, so people can come down and come to the middle, it'll give them some easier shots. Uh, if you wanna bring your name tag, that's fine. This is public relations, sorta. You know. This is. Not pre this, I'd like to introduce you to some people who have some information that you need to know about. I'm hesitant to go that far. Special greeting card. No, this isn't a greeting card. No, no. You're, you're, you're introducing. No, it's not a message. It's, it, it's, it's a. You're introducing these people to them. Like literally. Hey, you know, these people. I want you to know about them. That's all we need to do. All right. No, no, no. We. I sort of did that. I, need, I, I, I don't want to get that personal because I mean now we're getting into some strange areas. I don't want. I don't want to get uh, in a situation where you know we're overstepping our bounds. You know. And, yeah. I want to introduce you to the speakers of the Tech Conference 2005. But this is what the members of Congress need to do. No, uh, all right. That's what I'm trying to get at. Here, let me help you. I'm trying to get you to move here. Okay. That's not going to work. Never mind. Okay. Yeah, hang on, hang on, hang on. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, well, the, the, 
but I, I would like to, by, by means of this, by means of this video, uh, by the means of this, uh, this video, I would like to introduce to you uh, the members of the speakers of XL, X Conference 2005, because I think it's very important. Okay. Mm -hmm. I get the photos. And then she, but she's what she's about to do is going to go. It's going to be edited to the front of the tape that we're going to the, the DVD that we're going to send out. Hello, I'm Cheryl Jones, and I would like to. Oh. Thank you. Hello, I'm Cheryl Jones, and I would like to introduce to you the speakers. <laughs> what? Oh, okay. Well, let's do a one, two, three. Let's do some one, two, threes. Okay, go. Get ready for the one, two, three. Thank you. That's good. That's good. All right. Uh, okay, Cheryl, go ahead. More one, two, threes. Okay. More one, two, three. One, two, three. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. Now you can take a few more if you like. It's okay. It's okay. Got caught. She's all right. Okay, let's be careful now. Let's be careful. I think we got a lot of shots here. We need to get closed up now. Cheryl, stand up. Okay. Be careful back there. I have no insurance. I really don't have any insurance. Trust me, and no insurance. No, this is perfect. I closed it, and you introduced it. And you understand that when I do this, kiddo, there's going to be repercussions. I mean, you're out there now. Okay, we are going to try something different. This is, a, this is the best camera. Okay. So we are all going to look into this lab because otherwise it starts to look right. Okay. Thank you to mention I would like to introduce you to the speakers uh, of a just completed X conference okay. 2005 uh, because I believe they have important information to okay. to try to share. So uh, that's it. That's it. Yes. One. Try to look savage. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Sergio is irrepressible. Yes. <laughs> Into the lab. That's the first thing. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, it has to be idea. short. If it goes over, yeah. you know, seven seconds, yeah. they've already tossed it. Yeah. Let them try to find out. No, no. Let them try to find out who the hell you are. And they probably will. No, you should stand. Okay. Otherwise, you look too diminished. Okay, we're going to try to get this. We're going to try to get this take. This is a. This is the opening to the uh, DVD that the Congress members will get. Okay. It's short. We're going to get it in one shot because it's a professional. Here. Do Are you, you ready? Do, do you want uh, maybe an extra segment for this? Hello, I'm Cheryl Jones. We're making a special video for the members of Congress because we have an excellent lineup of speakers who've just finished a very important X conference 2005 with some very important information we think you need to hear. Bingo. Thank you. That was it. <laughs> Four tape, not bad, not bad. Okay, folks. There's a cocktail party in the, uh, in the, oh, okay, okay. Well, uh, they're going to do a little more, but there's a cocktail party in the Crystal's Ballroom. It's open to all. Beware, I'm going to be coming in and I want your money, okay? But go and enjoy until then. Some excellent hors d'oeuvres and wine, I should say.